Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this very special session. Um, the Stockbox community, of course, uh, has always, for many decades, regularly produced world-changing research. Um, but in my opinion, that's not the only reason where our community is so strong and vibrant, because um, we also have this really healthy habit of, of celebrating uh, and honoring and promoting our world-changing results. And we do it in many ways, through awards, through teaching, through connecting with and influencing other fields. Um, and this session is very much a celebration, a celebration of one of the most world-changing results uh, in the history of computer science. So the, the third ever stock conference, this was Stock 71, uh, that took place 50 years ago. It was in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Uh, and at that conference, Stephen Cook presented his paper, The Complexity of Theorem Proven Procedures, uh, which defined what we now call NP-complete problems and proved what we now call the Cook-Levin theorem. Contemporaneously, working behind the Iron Curtain in what was then the Soviet Union, Leonid Levin developed a comparable collection of definitions and results. Not long after, Richard Karp demonstrated the power and reach of this theory by establishing the NP-completeness of 21 fundamental problems that span the gamut of different application domains. So as part of today's celebration of the Cook-Levin theorem and its far-reaching consequences, uh, we will be hearing from each of Stephen Cook, Leonid Levin, and Richard Karp. And I'm also pleased to report the two other legendary theoretical computer scientists, Christos Papadimitriou and Abby Victorson, have agreed to serve as your guides to provide additional commentary. So we'll, we'll begin the session with a pre-recorded video by Stephen Cook. That'll be ballpark 20 minutes. Um, then we'll have a pre-recorded video by Leonid Levin, also ballpark 20 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have live remarks by Richard Carr. Uh, and if all continues to go well and there's no technical snafus, uh, all three of them will be available to, to answer your questions throughout this session. Uh, so Christos and Avi, they'll lead the discussion following these three talks. Uh, throughout the session, please use the Q&A button uh, to submit your questions. <coughs> Christos, Avi, and I will all be monitoring the questions as they come in, uh, and then we'll go ahead and bring them up uh, at the most appropriate time in the session. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's begin with a video by Stephen Cook. I will start this talk by pointing out that I'm 81 years old and feeling rather forgetful. Fortunately, I have two very bright friends, Tony Patassi, a long ago PhD student of mine, now a faculty member in our department who has just won the 2021 EATCS award. And my son, James Cook, who worked for Google for five years after his PhD and then resigned to take an academic interest, teaching and research. He has re recent stock conference papers co-authored with Tony's current student, Ian Mertz. Part one, my background. I received my mathematics bachelor's degree at the University of Michigan in 1961, and my mathematics PhD at Harvard University in 1966. During both of these, I took a strong interest in computers, starting with the vacuum tube computer IBM 650 at Michigan, and a summer job <coughs> helping to get the vacuum tube computer Bendix G15 programmed to help fighter pilots land safely in an aircraft carrier. My PhD advisor at Harvard was Howell Wong, who was a logician and had a strong interest in computers. He had worked for the IBM Watson Research Laboratory before coming to Harvard and had a strong interest in using computers to prove theorems it was really clear that logic and computation were very interesting subjects. Alan Cobham also played an important role in my early work. He was a Harvard doctor student before I arrived, although he had left to work for IBM after completing his thesis without actually receiving his PhD. Cobham posed the question, in what way is multiplication harder than addition? This had a major influence in my PhD thesis, which focused, which focused on the difficulty of multiplication. Cobham's 1965 paper, The Intrinsic Computational Difficulty of Functions, about what we now call capital P, 
polynomial time had a major influence on my later work. Of course, I should also mention Jack Edmonds' 1965 paper, Paths, Trees, and Flowers, in which he independently introduced polynomial time. But I didn't know about his work until later. My first job after my 1966 PhD was at the University of California, Berkeley. My position there was unusual. It was half time in the math department and half time in the so-called computer center. It was an on-campus computing facility, but it was separate from the university's new <coughs> computer science department. The computing center was part of the College of Letters and Science, while the computer science department was part of the College of Engineering. It was an odd situation brought about by piecemeal approach to accommodating the new and emerging field of computers into existing faculties. I was responsible for supervising graduate students almost immediately. My first student turned out to be an exceptional one, Walter Savage, whose work for his dissertation at Berkeley led to his discovery of Savage's theorem, which says that for any function f of n, at least size log n, n circ of f of n is the subset of d space of f of n squared. Note that we won't, that we don't think that n time f of n, f of n is subset of d time of f of n squared, but he, he proved his theorem for space instead of time. Um, unless we think p equals np, which is probably, uh, most of us don't think that. Savage turned out to be one of my most famous students. Unfortunately for me, my Berkeley wife and my Ber Berkeley wife, Linda, after four years in Berkeley, the math department denied me tenure. The new computer science department was there and would be the natural place for me, but apparently the dean said something like, the budget committee is not going to grant this guy a tenured position if so prestigious a department as mathematics has denied him tenure. This was a bit of blow for me and Linda. I did not have three papers. I sorry, I did have three papers in referee journals and papers in the first two stock conferences, 1969, 1970, not counting Savage's thesis based on a paper in stock 1969. I understand that some nice colleagues, including Descartes, <coughs> excuse me, tried to convince the dean otherwise, but to no avail. The budding computer science department at the University of Toronto made me a nice offer, and I decided to take it. This was this has been a good place for me, but still it was a jolt for Linda and me. Linda and I arrived in Toronto in September 1970. Initially, my job at the University of Toronto was half in the mathematics department and half in the new computer science department, which was initially made part of the mathematics department. But I soon realized my main interests were in the computer science department, so I became completely a member of that department. Having papers in the first two stock conferences, 1969-1970, it seemed natural to submit a paper to the third stock conference, 1971. So I did submit a paper which was accepted, but the submission did not include the part introducing the notion of NP completeness, which of course is the part that created real attention later. Instead, I was using the Herbrand theorem to discuss the efficiency of theorem proving procedures for the predicate calculus. The final version I sent included a new idea, <coughs> which included the following paragraphs. Summary. It is shown that recognition problems solved by a polynomial time-bounded non-deterministic Turing machine can be reduced to the problem 
of determining whether a given propositional formula is a tautology. Here, reduced means, roughly speaking, that the first problem can be solved deterministically in polynomial time, provided an oracle is available for solving the second. From this notion of reducible, polynomial degrees of difficulty are defined, and it is shown that the problem of determining tali, tautology hood has the same polynomial degree as the problem of determining whether the first two given graphs in an isomorphic uh, to a subgraph of the second. Other examples are, are discussed, a method of measuring the complexity of proof procedures for the predicate calculus is introduced and discussed. So this is the summary I finished. Throughout this paper, a set of strings means a set of strings on some fixed large finite alphabet capital sigma. This alphabet is large enough to include symbols for all sets described here. All Turing machines are deterministic recognition devices unless the contrary is explicitly stated. Okay, section one in my paper, tautologies and polynomial reducibility. Let us fix a formalism for the propositional calculus in which formulas are written as strings on capital sigma. Since we will require infinitely many proposition symbols, atoms that is, each such symbol will consist of a member of capital sigma followed by a number in binary notation. This formula of length n can only have about n over log n distinct uh, function and predicate symbols. The logical connectives are and or not. The set of tautologies, denoted by tautologies, is certain, uh, braces tautology, sorry, is a certain recursive set of strings on this alphabet. And we are interested in the problem of finding a good lower bound on its possible recognition times. We provide no such lower bound here, but theorem one will give evidence that tautologies is a difficult set to recognize since many apparently difficult problems can be reduced to determining tautology hood. By reduce, quote, we mean roughly speaking that if the tautology hood could be decided instantly by an oracle, then these problems could be decided in polynomial time. In order to make this notion precise, we introduce query machines, which are like Turing machines with oracles um, in Frieder and Ritchie, 1964. A query machine, in quotes, is a multi-tape Turing machine with a distinguished type tape called the query tape and three distinguished states called the query state, yes state and no state respectively. If M is the computation of, if M is the, is the query machine and T is the set of strings, then a T computation of M is the computation of M in which initially M is the new initial state and has an input string W on its input tape. And each time M assumes the query state, there is a string U on the query tape. And the next state M is the yes state if U is in T and the no state is U not in T. We think of an oracle which knows T placing M in the yes state or no state. <laughs> So um, now, definition. A set S of strings is P reducible, P for polynomial, to a set capital T of strings, if and only if there is some query machine capital M and a polynomial Q of N, such that for each input string W, the T computation of M with input W halts within Q of length W steps, length W, okay, and ends 
in an accepting state if and only if W is in S. It is not hard to see that P-reducibility is a transitive relation. Thus, the relation E on sets of strings given by the pair ST in E is in E if and only if each of S and T is P reducible to the other is an equivalence relation. The equivalence class containing a set S will be denoted by degree of S, that is the polynomial degree of difficulty of S. That's DE, DEG of S. Okay, capital note. Dick Karp's later paper defined reducibility more simply. S is reducible to T if and only if there's a polynomial F of X such that X is in S if and only if F of X is in T. So that if S, so that if S is reducible to T in the Karp sense, then it is reducibility in my sense, but the converse is not necessarily true. Definition, we would denote degree zero by L star. And that's the polynomial time where zero denotes the zero function. Here L star is the class of sets recognizable in polynomial time. L star was discussed in reference to page five and is um, the string analog of Cobham's class L of functions. It's another, these are in the, in the, uh, um, that these, these are related um, documents. Anyway, C slides were two and three. Anyway, we now define the following special sets of strings. One, the subgraph problem is the problem given two finite undirected graphs determine whether the first is isomorphic to a subgraph of the second. A graph G can be represented by a string bar of G on the alphabet zero one star. By listing the successive rows of its adjacency matrix separated by stars. We let subgraph pairs denote the set of strings bar of G sub one, star star, bar of G sub two, says that G sub one is isomorphic to a subgraph of G sub two. Okay, that's one, the subgraph problem. Two, the graph isomorphism problem be represented by the set denoted by braces isomorphic graph pairs of all strings, bar of G1 star star bar of G2, such that G1 is isomorphic to G2. Three, the set primes, capital primes, is the set of all binary notations for prime numbers. Four, the set DNF tautologies is the set of strings representing tautologies in disjunctive normal form. And five, the set D3 consists of those tautologies in disjunctive normal form in which each disjunct has in most three conjuncts, each of which is an atom of negation of an atom. The following theorems were proved. Theorem one. If a set of strings is accepted by some non-deterministic Turing machine within polynomial time, then capital S is capital P reducible to DNF tautologies. Corollary, each of the sets in definitions one to five is P reducible to DNF tautologies. This is because each set or its complement is accepted in polynomial time by some non-deterministic Turing machine. Theorem two, the following sets are P-reducible to each other in pairs. And the three things are tautologies, these are embraces, DNF tautologies, embraces, D sub three, and, um, and then subgraph pairs. So these things are all reducible to each other in pairs. 
Incidentally, it's not hard to see from the davis putnam procedure that the set D2 consistent, consisting of all DNF tautologies with at least two conjuncts per disjunct is in L star, in other words, polytime. Hence, D2 cannot be added to the list of theorem two unless all sets in the list are in L star. Okay, the theorems were proved. I'm not going to try to prove the theorems. Section two in my paper was labeled discussion and included the following remarks. Theorem one and its corollary gives um, theorems, yeah, theorem one and its corollary gives strong evidence that it is not easy to determine whether a given propositional formula is a tautology even if the formula is in descent to normal form. Theorems one and two together suggest that it is fruitless to search for a polynomial decision procedure for the subgraph problem, since success would bring polynomial decision procedures to many other apparently intractable problems. Of course, the same remark applies to any combinatorial problem to which tautologies is pre-reducible. Furthermore, the theorem suggests that tautologies is a good candidate for an interesting set, not in L star. That is, not in polynomial time, and I feel it is worth spending considerable effort trying to prove this conjecture. Such a proof would be a major breakthrough in complexity theory i.e. p not equal to np. In modern terminology, it seems likely that p not equal to np, but it's going to be hard to prove it. Of course, Dix Karp's famous 1972 reducible, reducibility among combinatory problems gave 21 NP, np complete problems with a nice definition the right page here, of NP complete, and this really showed the importance of this notion. The Clay Mathematics Institute selected the P versus NP problem as one of the seven Millennium Prize problems, announcing May 24th, year 2000. Each problem is worth $1 million. The P versus NP problem is still open as I think most of them are. Anyway, my own opinion on the P versus NP problem was given in my paper called The Importance of the P versus NP Question. And this is in JACM, Journal of ACM number 50, uh, one, 2003. That is the 50th anniversary issue, pages 27, 29. This paper is available on my home page. Here are a couple of paragraphs from that paper. Most complexity theorists, including the author, believe that P not equal to NP. I would summarize the argument in favor of P not equal to NP by saying that we are really good at inventing efficient algorithms, but really bad at proving algorithms don't exist. There are powerful techniques, which are part of the standard undergraduate computer science curriculum of devising efficient algorithms for diverse problems. Millions of smart people, including engineers and programmers, have tried hard for many years to find a provably efficient algorithm for one or more of the thousand or so NP-complete problems, but without success. Contrast this with the efforts of the small set of mathematicians who seriously work on proving P not equal to NP, there are reasons why the main techniques tried for proving complexity lower bounds may not work for showing P not equal to NP. A proof based on diagonalization cannot relativize. Furthermore, there are natural complexity classes, class separations, which we know exists, but we cannot prove. Consider the sequence of complexity class inclusions, 
capital log space is a subset of P, that's probably time, is a subset of NP, uh, and which is a subset of P space. A simple diagonal, uh, diagonal argument shows that the first is a proper subset of the last, that is log space is a proper subset of P space. So it follows that one of the three adjacent inclusions must be proper. The adjacent inclusions log space subset P, P subset of NP, and NP subset of P space. But no proof is known that any particular one is proper. Although this paper was written 18 years ago, but the arguments still apply. All right, um, Krista Zanavi, did you want to have any comments now, short, briefly, before we move on to Professor Levin's video? Or well, uh, I think you know we, we are we are blessed. Uh, you know, it's uh, we uh, we have uh, not only read uh, Cook's, Cook's paper, but but uh, Steve Cook read it to us. So but, you know. Uh, I feel I feel uh, I feel really good right now. <laughs> All right, um, right. So uh, just to remind everybody who, who came in late, uh, please use the use the Q and A functionality in Zoom uh, to submit your questions. Um, Christo Zabi and I will be monitoring throughout the session, and we'll bring them up um, at the appropriate time. And so, in particular, after we hear from. Um, uh, all, all of Stephen Cook and Leonid Levin and Richard Karp. At that point, we'll have a discussion uh, with Avi and Christos, uh, and we'll address any of the questions that have come up uh, to that point. All right, but without further ado, uh, let's move on to um, a video by Professor Levin. I will start this talk by pointing out Hello, and thank you very much for having invited me. I will talk about an issue that I think is important, but mostly avoided for seemingly vague and confusing reasons. Our computers do a huge number of absolutely wonderful things, yet most of these things seem rather mechanical. Lots of crucial problems that do yield to the intuition of our very slow brains are beyond our current computer arts. Great many of these tasks can be stated in the form of inverting easily computable functions or reduced to this form. That is, finding inputs or actions that could produce a given result in a given realistic process. We have no idea about intrinsic difficulty of these tasks, and yet, Traveling salesmen do get to their destinations. Mathematicians do find proofs of their theorems. And physicists do find patterns in transformations of their bosons and fermions. How is this done? And how could computers emulate their success? Of course, these are collective achievements of many minds engrossed in a huge number of papers. But today, computers can easily search through all mass and physics papers ever written. The limitation is not in physical capacity. And brains of insects solve problems of such complexity and with such efficiency as we cannot dream of. Yet, few of us would be flattered by comparison to the brain of an insect. What advantage do we humans have? One is the ability to solve new problems, those on which evolution did not train zillions of our ancestors. We must have some pretty universal methods, not dependent on the specifics of focused problems. Of course, it is hard to tell how, say, mathematicians find their proofs. Yet the diversity and dynamism of mass achievements suggests that some pretty universal mechanisms must be at work. Let me now get more technical 
and focus on a specific problem. Consider, for instance, algorithms that three color given graphs. Is it true that every such algorithm can be sped up 10 times on some infinite set of graphs? Or there is a perfect algorithm that cannot be sped up 10 times even on a subset of graphs. Note that there is a three coloring algorithm that cannot be sped up by more than a constant factor on any subset. The question is, must this factor get really big? But before further discussion, let me go into some history. In the 50s, in the Russian mass community, there was much interest in the work of Claude Shannon. But many of Shannon's constructions required exhaustive search of all configurations. There was an intense interest in whether these exponential procedures could be eliminated. And Sergei Yablonsky wrote a paper that he interpreted as showing that no sub-exponential method could work on a problem that is in today's terms co and p. It is a problem of finding a Boolean function of maximal circuit complexity. Kolmogorov saw this claim as baseless, since the proof considered only a specific type of algorithms. He was quite unhappy with such a misleading idea being promoted. Kolmogorov advocated the need of efforts to find valid proofs that some commonly believed complexities of popular problems are, in fact, unavoidable. For that, he needed convincing definition of the running time. But Turing machines were seen as too limited in speed to use for meaningful lower bounds. Kolmogorov formulated a graph-based model of algorithms that had time complexities as we understand them today. He also organized a seminar where he challenged mathematicians with quadratic complexity of multiplication. An unexpected answer was soon found by Anatoly Karatsuba and improved by Andrei Toom. Multiplication complexity turned out to be nearly linear. It is now really fast with subsequent improvements by Stephen Cook and others. There was, this was an impressive indication that common sense is an unreliable guide for hardness of computational problems and must be verified by valid proofs. I, at this time, was extremely excited by some other work of Kolmogorov. He and independently Ray Solomonov have used Turing's universal algorithm to give an optimal definition of informational complexity, randomness, and some other related concepts. I noted that similar constructions allow defining an optimal up to a constant factor algorithm for a problem now called tiling, and therefore for any search problem, as they all have straightforward reduction to tiling. To my chagrin, Kolmogorov was not impressed with the concept of optimality, saw it as too abstract for the issue at hand. But he was much more interested in my remark that tiling allows reduction to it of all search problems. He thought that I should publish that rather than the optimal search. I thought it would be worth publishing only if I can reduce it to some popular problems. My obstacle was that combinatorics was not popular in Russia. And my choice of problems that might impress the math community was rather limited. I saw no hope for something like factoring, but spent years in naive attempts on things like graph isomorphism, finding small circuits for Boolean tables, etc. And an interesting angle was added to these issues. In 1969, Mike Dektyar, a student of Boris Trachtenbrot in Novosibirsk, published a proof that under some oracles, 
inverting simple functions has exponential complexity. In the US, Baker, Gill, and Soloway did this independently. Later, I ran into problems with communist authorities. And friends advised me to quickly publish all I have, while the access to publishing is not just close to me. So I submitted several papers in that 1972, including the one about search, where Kolmogorov agreed to let me include the optimal search. I guess I must thank the communists for this publication. But the greatest developments by far were going in the United States. Cook, Karp, and David Johnson made a really revolutionary discovery. They found that three set reduces to great many important combinatorics problems. Combinatorics received much attention in the West, and these results become a coup. Kolmogorov asked several questions at that time, still open and interesting. One was, are there polynomial time algorithms that have no linear size circuits? We knew that some slow polynomial time algorithms cannot be replaced by faster algorithms. But can linear size circuits, families, replace all of them? His other interesting comment was a bit more involved. We provided at that time, we proved at that time, mutual information between strings is roughly symmetric. The proof involved exponential search among all short, fast programs, transforming a given string x into y. Kolmogorov wondered if this would not be a better candidate than my tiling to see if search problems are exponentially hard. Short, fast, by the way, were meant to be robust, tolerating additive constant slacks in length and logarithm of time. Kolmogorov said that often good candidates to consider is that is neither too general nor too narrow. Tiling being universal may be too general, lacking focus. Some other problems, say factoring, too narrow, and search for such for fast short programs looked like a good middle bet to him. It still does to me. Such search is involved in another type of problems that challenge our creativity, extrapolating the observed data to their whole natural domains. It is called by many names, inductive inference, passive learning, and others. Occam razor is a famous principle of extrapolation. A version attributed to Einstein suggests Conjecture should be chosen as simple as possible, but not simpler. Ray Solomonov gave it a more formal expression. He said that the likelihoods of various extrapolations consistent with known data decrease exponentially with the length of their shortest descriptions. These short programs run about as fast as the process that had generated the data. There have been several technical issues that required further attention. I will stay on a simple side, not going into those details. Most of them have been clarified by now if we ignore the time needed to find such short, fast programs. This may be hard. Yet, this is an inversion task bringing us back to the issue of optimal search. I have a little discussion of such issues in a short paper called Universal Heuristics, How Do Humans Solve Unsolvable Problems? You see a reference and a link on the slide. Now, back to my focus. The concept of optimal algorithm for search problems 
ignores constant factors completely. So it is tempting to assume that they must be enormous. However, this doesn't seem so to me. Our brains have evolved on jumping in trees, not on writing mass articles. And yet, we prove Fermat's theorems, design nuclear bombs, and even write stock papers. We must have some quite efficient and quite universal guessing algorithms built in. So I repeat a formal question about these constants. Can every algorithm for complete search problems be sped up 10 times on an infinite subset? Of course, Carlos' definition of time can allow fake speedups. For instance, if we ignore the size of the alphabet and reduce the number of steps just by making each step larger due to the larger alphabet. Or if we exclude the required end testing of the input-output relation. And choose the relation that itself allows a non-constant speed up. But it is easy to carefully define time to preclude such cheating. Let me now go into some little technicalities to see what issues are involved in understanding these constant factors. We look at the optimal search for an inverse W of a fast algorithm F. Given the output X, it must produce on, a, on W. We refine Kolmogorov complexity with time, making it computable. The time-refined complexity KT of W given X considers all prefixless programs P by which the universal algorithm U generates W from X in time T. The time includes running F on W to check that the result is X. KT is the minimum of the length of P plus logarithm of this time T. The optimal inverter searches for solutions W in order of increasing the complexity KT of W given X, not of length of W. For instance, short proofs may be much harder to find, having higher complexities than longer proofs. The inverter generates and checks in time 2 to the k all w up to complexity k. By the way, the optimal search makes the concept of complexity applicable to individual instances of search tasks, not just to families of instances, which we now call problems and complexities of which we study. So we can ask how hard it is, say, to find a short proof of Fermat's theorem, not of theorems in general. Would not this notion fit tighter? The big catch is that each wasteful bit U requires of P doubles the time. We would need a very pure U frugal with wasting bits. Do our brains have such a one built in? It seems so to me. We do seem to have little disagreement on what is neat and what is cumbersome. There are differences in our tastes, but they are not so huge that we could not understand each other's aesthetics. But this is just a feeling. The formal question remains. Is there an algorithm for a complete search problem that cannot be sped up 10 times even on an infinite subset. Of course, this 10 is a bit arbitrary, can be replaced with your favorite reasonable constant. I have no time for another issue related to search problems that interests me, climbing algorithms. Search problems have easy correctness tests for solutions. Climbing algorithms allow an easy assessment of how close to the 
to yielding the correct answer is the configuration at any stage of the run. This offers much flexibility, as it can be instantly assessed how sensible is any deviation from the standard procedures. An example is the dual matrix algorithm for linear programming. It has little sensitivity to numerical errors and the number of inequalities. It offers substantial flexibility and thus potential for further developments. I discuss these issues in an article Climbing Algorithms in the Proceedings of this talk. Thank you very much and questions are welcome over email or over any other means that organizers could provide. Thanks. Fantastic. Javier and Christos. It was, it was fascinating. Uh, I mean, I'd say one uh, thing among the many I learned is uh, how forward-looking uh, Kolmogorov was in his questions. I knew about some of uh, <laughs> I knew about some of what you told us, but not about all. It's it's really remarkable. We should be grateful for his taste for picking up this uh, this uh, universality result. And on the Q&A, Henry Yuen uh, makes an observation, which, which I also found very striking, which was, um, you know, Professor Levin's discussion of, of which problems he chose um, as, as candidate sort of other NP-complete problems and how that was you know, dictated by the, the tastes in his community at that time. Um, and so Henry goes on to say, you know, I wonder what blind spots our community, the current stock community, uh, may have at the moment and what insights we might be missing. Um, because there are certain topics that are popular and other topics that are that are unpopular. So thanks for the comment, Henry. Okay, so um, Dick, I think the the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. I'm uh, really pleased to be here on this same virtual stage as so many legends of computer science. Uh, I've enjoyed the presentations by Stephen Cook and Leonard Lohman and Tim, thank you very much for putting this together. Um, my talk will be historical in nature and somewhat personal. I would like to lead you through some of the developments in the 1950s and 1960s that I'm that influenced my thinking and uh, led me to and enabled me to appreciate the significance of what Steve Cook had done in 1971 and enabled me to determine that it would be possible to build on the foundation that Steve and Leonid in, in the Soviet Union had provided. Let me uh, begin with uh, an extended uh, quotation from my 1972 paper, uh, Reducibility Among Combinatorial Problems. All the general methods presently known for computing the chromatic number of a graph, deciding whether a graph has a Hamiltonian circuit or solving an integer programming problem require a combinatorial search for which the worst case time requirement grows exponentially with the length of the input. In this paper, we give theorems which strongly suggest, but do not imply, that these problems, as well as many others, will remain intractable perpetually. We exhibit a set of well-known combinatorial problems, including those mentioned above, which are equivalent in the sense that a polynomial bounded algorithm for any one of them would effectively yield a polynomial bounded algorithm for all. We also show that if these problems do possess polynomial bounded algorithms, then all the problems in an unexpectedly large class, roughly speaking, the class of problems solvable by polynomial depth backtrack search, possess polynomial bounded algorithms. 
the developments that um, <clears throat> I want to uh, uh, per pursue uh, led to the celebrated 1971 paper in which Stephen Cook showed that P is equal to NP if and only if the satisfiability problem of propositional logic is solvable in polynomial time. Here P is deterministic polynomial time. NP is non-deterministic polynomial time or equivalently the class of problems where uh, solutions can be verified in polynomial time given a suitable witness. Cook's proof of the, what we would now call the NP completeness of, of SAT is based on a generic polynomial time mapping that recasts the instances of any problem in NP as equivalent instances of SAT. Having grappled with many canonical combinatorial search problems for which no polynomial slip time solutions were available, I conjectured that each of these problems had the same universal character as the satisfiability problem. And I set out to show by means of polynomial time reductions from SAT that each of these problems lies in P if and only if P equals NP. Such problems are called NP complete. By now, thousands of such problems in NP have been proven by re reductions to be NP complete. And it appears that the great majority of combinatorial search problems arising in practice are NP complete. In this talk, I would like to trace the developments in combinatorial algorithms, computational complexity, and computability theory that I became aware of as a student in the 1950s and a researcher at IBM in the 1960s. Results that gave me the context for understanding the import of Cook's 1971 paper and led me to systematically pursue polynomial time reducibility. I will talk in turn about some of the early developments of efficient algorithms and the, the recognitions that certain other problems seem to be very hard. Then I will talk about the, uh, the birth of complexity theory and ultimately the emphasis on polynomial time computation. And finally, I will mention the influence of computability theory on complexity theory. The development of polynomial time graph theoretic algorithms dates back as far as a 1926 paper by Borufka giving an algorithm for constructing minimum spanning trees. Borufka and those scientists in his generation didn't have a formal model of computation, let alone an understanding of data structures, uh, but they still could recognize a good algorithm when presented with it. And the algorithm that Borovka gave for spanning trees is such a good algorithm. Another early development was the Hungarian algorithm of Kuhn and Munkris, which solves the famous assignment problem of constructing minimum cost matching in a bipartite graph. In the 60s, Ford and Fulkerson gave algorithms for a variety of problems related to flows and networks. Dijkstra's famous shortest path problem and shortest, al uh, shortest path algorithm came along in 1960. These, are, uh, these pioneers were not focused on squeezing out the best possible bounds on worst case running time and were not armed with formal models of computation or refined data structures that came along in later decades. Subsequent advances improved that the running times of algorithms for all of these problems are improve the running times of algorithms for all of these problems, often achieving near linear time bounds with uh, the help of, of sophisticated data structures. George Danzig's historic simplex algorithm for the centrally important linear programming problem of minimizing a linear function of n variables subject to linear inequality constraints 
appeared in 1947. The simplex algorithm is highly efficient in practice, but requires exponential time on a set of rare artificially constructed instances, and therefore does not qualify as a polynomial time algorithm, a blemish that is of greater concern to complexity theorists than to practitioners. Kachian's ellipsoid algorithm, 1979, was the first polynomial time algorithm for linear programming but it remains a theoretical curiosity because of its poor performance on typical instances. <clears throat> uh, the lesson of comparing Kachian's result, result with Danzig's uh, reminds us that worst case complexity is not necessarily the only yardstick that we use in evaluating algorithms. Starting with Karmakar 1983, a series of successively improved interior point methods for linear programming have been developed, which run in worst case polynomial time and, and compete well in practice with the simplex method. And there has been, been a continuing succession of improved, improved versions of the interior point approach to linear programming using uh, methods from linear algebra. Integer programming is the problem of minimizing a linear function subject to linear inequality constraints with the added constraints that all variables are integers. George Danzig demonstrated that integer programming encompasses a wide variety of combinatorial optimization problems. And he viewed it as a universal format for combinatorial optimization problems. If he had been armed with the apparatus of complexity theory, he might very well have introduced the kosher, introduced the notion of NP completeness. The founders of combinatorial optimization recognized that integer programming was much more challenging than the graph theoretic problems of network flows matching minimum spanning trees and shortest paths that they had conquered. Geometrically, linear programming is the minimization of a linear function over an n-dimensional polytope, whereas integer programming is the minimization of a linear function over the set of integer points within the associated linear programming polytope. The cutting plane approach to integer programming begins by solving the associated linear program. The optimal solution will be a corner point of the linear programming polytope. And if it is an integer point, then it is an optimal solution to the integer program. If not, then the linear constraint is added, which is violated at the corner point, but satisfied by all integer points of the polytope. Computation continues, slicing away parts of the linear programming polytope until an optimal integer so solution is exposed. In 1958, Ralph Gomery proved that a version of the cutting plane method terminates with an optimal solution for every bounded integer programming instance. There have been great advances in the practical solution of integer programming problems. Open source, uh, open source software solvers such as Gurobi, based on cutting planes, perform impressively in practice but are not guaranteed to succeed. My colleague, Dan Gusfield, who has used integer programming extensively in computational biology, suggests, always try integer programming, it may work. The famous Euclidean traveling salesman problem is to find the minimum distance to or through a set of cities in the plane. It has long been viewed as a hard combinatorial problem and used as a challenge for both heuristics and exact algorithms. In an early test of the cutting plane approach, Danzig, uh, Fulkerson, and Johnson, 1959, succeeded in computing the shortest tour through the 48 US state capitals plus Washington, DC, using a uh, cutting plane method uh, together with linear programming. Cutting plane algorithms due to Applegate, Bixby, Kvato, Cook, Kvato, and Tim Cook 
have solved TSP instances with up to 85,900 cities at the cost of consuming a number of CPU years. So um, uh, cutting plane methods have proved their value in the context of this important test problem of the traveling salesman. Let me turn now uh, from the history of successful combinatorial algorithms to the birth of computational complexity theory, which can be traced to Michael Rabin's 1960 paper, Degree of Difficulty of Computing a Function and a Partial Ordering of Recursive Sets. Inspired by Rabin's work, Manuel Blum defined a complexity measure axiomatically as a, uh, as a computable predicate of three arguments, M, X, and T, where M is a Turing machine, X is a bit string, and T is a positive integer. The predicate is true if the cost of executing machine M on input X is at most T. So this is a very general notion of a measure of complexity, this so-called cost function. And it certainly includes the standard measures of time and space, as well as many other variations. Hartmanis and Stearns then turned to uh, Turing machine time and space complexity and defined spe they defined specific complexity measures based on time or space required by a Turing machine as a function of the input length. Uh, and they proved certain hierarchy methods uh, hierarchy results, which basically showed that if you increase the time bound sufficiently, you get functions that you couldn't compute before. And if you increase the space bound, similarly, um, you very easily get increased power. So the, these, uh, these hierarchies were developed by them. And they also compared the uh, relative time and space requirements of different variations of the Turing machine model. Revolutionary change gradually occurred in the 1960s where attention was focused specifically on the question, what can be done in polynomial time? In a 1964 paper, Alan Cobham was the first to define the complexity class that we now call P. With great foresight, he proposed that for theoretical purposes, a function should be considered efficiently computable if and only if it lies in P. This point of view has been widely accepted. From 1964 onward, the study of polynomial time computation has been a major thrust in the theory of computation. Strangely, I never met Cobham, even though we both worked at the same large IBM research lab during the 60s. Jack Edmonds, another early investigator of polynomial time computation, has had a major influence on my thinking. During the mid 60s, we worked together on algorithms for network flow and bipartite matching problems. But more importantly, in one amazing day when I visited Jack at the National Bureau of Standards, he explained to me his famous polynomial time blossom algorithm for the non bipartite matching problem, as well as his beautiful polynomial time algorithms for optimal branchings and maximum Metroid intersection. Jack's approach to all of these problems is based on the fact that when formulated as decision problems, these problems are easily seen to lie in NP intersect co-NP. This was the, this class NP intersect co-NP was the class that he focused on. And he even conjectured uh, that um, P is equal to NP intersect co NP, so, uh, a, a conjecture which uh, has not been proven or disproven. Ever since that fateful visit with uh, Jack, uh, with, uh, with Jack, Jack Edmonds, uh, a large portion of the, a large section of the courses I've taught on combinatorial optimization problem have been based on Jack's work on polynomial time computation. The third stream of work that influenced my insights and um, the development of the field 
is the debt that computational complexity theory pays to computability theory. Uh, one of the important concepts imported to computable to complexity theory is the concept of a mapping reduction, which is fundamental to computability theory and has been adapted to the study of NP completeness. A decision problem is a partition of a domain such as zero one star set of strings on zeros on the alphabet zero one or any other suitable set of strings. Um, a partition of the input uh, domain into accepted instances and rejected instances. A mapping reduction from decision problem F to decision problem G is a function K that maps the accepted instances for F to the accepted instances for G and the rejected inputs for F to rejected instances for G. If F and G are total recursive functions and K is computable, it follows that G is undecidable if F is undecidable. So these mapping reductions allow us to transition from known undecidability results to further undecidability results. Mapping reductions are used to prove that problems are undecidable. For example, since the halting problem is undecidable, a computable mapping reduction from the halting problem to the post-correspondence problem establishes that the post-correspondence problem is undecidable. The theory of NP completeness applies mapping reductions at the level of polynomial time computation. Here, F and G lie in NP and the mapping K is polynomial time computable. A decision problem uh, G in NP is called NP complete if every decision problem F in NP is mapping reducible to G by a, a polynomial time mapping reduction. It follows that if G is NP complete, then P equals NP if and only if G is in P. Uh, I should mention as a footnote that Steve Cook uh, chose to develop the polynomial time reducibilities in the context of an oracle re reduction rather than a mapping reduction. Uh, whereas I worked with mapping reductions, which seemed to be adequate for my purposes. I'm not exactly clear which of those reductions uh, is in the official definition of NP complete. In my 1971 paper, Reducibility Among Combinatorial Problems, I used polynomial time mapping reductions to establish that many canonical problems in NP are NP complete. Since polynomial time mapping reducibility is a transitive relation, to show that a problem is NP complete, it suffices to give a polynomial time reduction to that problem from any problem already known to be NP complete. Since Cook's theorem tells us that SAT is NP-complete, this gives us a start. We start with reductions from SAT, and each subsequent reduction adds to our, uh, using the transitivity of reducibility, each subsequent reduction adds to our list of NP-complete problems. Cook's generic reduction of an arbitrary decision problem in NP to satisfy ability uh, goes as follows. Suppose we have a, uh, a non-deterministic polynomial time uh, machine that, des that decides F and let X be in the domain of F. We want to show that the acceptance of X is equivalent to the satisfiability of some suitably chosen um, disjunctive normal form uh, sentence in logic. To do this, we think of the computation of the non-deterministic machine as passing through a, a series of instantaneous descriptions. Each instant, instantaneous description um, specifies the, uh, the string that's on the uh, tape of the one tape machine, uh, the internal state, 
and the uh, location of the uh, of the read read write head on the tape, um, and the computation um, progresses through a series of instantaneous descriptions, uh, each of which is carries out one of, the, one of the atomic moves that are allowed in the definition of the non-deterministic machine. The entire trace of the computation then is a series of these instantaneous descriptions, uh, beginning with the original input, uh, ending in an accepting state, uh, and with each transition, uh, justified by one of the allowed uh, atomic uh, moves of the of the machine. In order for the computational trace to accept the input, um, we have to verify that the sequence of instantaneous descriptions is 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 valid according to the operation of the machine. We have to verify that it starts correctly with the input ends correctly in an accepting state. And each transition between successive instantaneous descriptions is compatible with one of the atomic rules uh, for the Turing machine. The point of all this is that the validity of the whole trace and of all the transitions from one instantaneous description to another uh, can be expressed in terms of very local properties in which, um, which one focuses on three successive tape squares uh, and looks at whether the transition from the contents of those tape squares uh, is allowed by the operation of the Turing machine. And we can verify that if all of, if this happens throughout the entire trace of computation, then it is an accepting uh, uh, computation. So the, this, each of these conditions on three consecutive tape squares gives uh, a, a, a Boolean expression that must be satisfied. Uh, and the uh, intersection of all those conditions is just uh, the desired instance of the satisfiability problem. So um, this uh, clever uh, proof that Steve Grip provided um, shows that satisfiability is universal in the sense that uh, every um, non-deterministic polynomial time problem can be reduced to satisfiability. I use the method of uh, mapping reductions, polynomial time mapping reductions to derive an initial set of 21 MP complete problems, and the method has been used to add thousands of other problems to the list. It appears that most combinatorial decision problems arising in science, engineering, operations research, logistics, and everyday life are NP-complete. Uh, the list of known NP-complete problems by now includes many advances over my original relatively crude results. For example, I proved that the chromatic number problem, the question of whether a graph can be colored with a given number of colors K. I proved that was NP complete, but Lovas proved that the graph three color ability is NP complete, a much stronger result. There, there, there are other results of, of, this, of similar refinements. Uh, for example, uh, Gary Johnson and um, Tarjan uh, proved that it's NP complete to test these, whether a graph has a Hamilton, Hamiltonian circuit, even for the special case of uh, three, uh, three triply connected uh, planar graphs of degree three. And there are many examples of, of uh, sharper results that can be obtained. Uh, than the relatively crude ones that I introduced. There are many mysteries remain. Um, 
it, it's really not, it's really unfortunate that I, stre I stressed the word equivalent in, in stating that the NP-complete problems are all equivalent because they're equivalent only in a narrow sense, whether, whether in the determination of whether they lie in P. But they can differ radically when we consider the ease of solving them in practice or the worst case approximation ratios within which they can be solved in polynomial time. And we still don't understand why enormous propositional satisfiability instances arising in digital design and program correctness analysis are often easy to uh, solve by methods related to resolution. But why we can build programs that play chess better than any human or can be trained to recognize images from a database when we can't even give a formal definition of what it would mean for such programs to be correct. Finally, we may ask why the P versus NP question has captured widespread curiosity while a host of other questions about complexity classes are discussed only within a small community of complexity theorists. I think there are two reasons. First, that the P versus NP question captures the fundamental distinction between the complexity of finding a proof and the complexity of verifying a proof. And secondly, because in practice, membership of a problem in P is a reasonable indicator of worst case tractability. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Avi and Christos, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Um, there is a pretty juicy question in the Q and A, uh, or alternatively, uh, we can we can do that now, or we can do that later, as you like. Uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Christopher said I decided on everything except who talks when. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I would say uh, one thing about the, uh, you know, the collections of talks and uh, something that uh, uh, was not mentioned. It seems that uh, clearly the motivation for uh, all original, uh, you know, works that we have. The, uh, were motivated from really a complexity theoretical point of view, trying to understand the difficulty of solving problems that we cared about. And uh, the evolution uh, maybe took 20 or 30 years of the impact of this uh, to becoming uh, an overarching uh, major intellectual problems in all the sciences and beyond the sciences. Uh, um, was not, uh, you know, was not understood originally. I mean, today we understand this, uh, what we call the um, lens of complexity on the sciences. We understand, I'm not sure who originated that, um, that, you know, maybe even if we don't know how to solve people's sample, it should be viewed as a law of nature, at least uh, similarly to the second law of thermodynamics, that every, every scientist ever proposing a model, if the model uh, turns out to efficiently solve an NP-complete problem, there is something there. Either it's wrong or, um, uh, you know, we should know about it and maybe it can help us via all these reductions to solve all the problems we want to uh, solve. Christos pointed out in a survey article probably 20 years ago that already then there were thousands of uh, papers in, uh, in a variety of scientific disciplines where even the title had NP-completeness uh, in it. So I don't know of a similar, uh, you know, uh, phenomena in, in, any, in any scientific field where one introduced the concept and then uh, it appears in the title of thousands of papers of uh, others. So what they, you know, <laughs> summarizing what I said, I wonder when this transformation uh, took place, when this understanding took place in the minds of, uh, you know, of the speakers of Steve and uh, Lonnie and uh, Dick. Um, it's, it's just interesting to I me. Guess also, was it there when, uh, when they were writing this, these wonderful papers? Uh, I, was, I was certainly convinced that the uh, we could draw the conclusion that 
the great majority of problems that arise in all these application areas are in fact NP-complete. Um, so uh, I, thought that, I, I thought that the impact on the sciences was likely to occur. But you are cautious not to say it in the paper. Um, probably a lapse rather than a conscious decision. <laughs> No, Leonid, uh, Steve, you, you want to comment on that? Okay, what's the juicy question, Tim? Uh, so, so Tamara Florin says, I am a science journalist working on an article on P versus NP for the Dutch magazine, New Scientist. May I ask, what would you hope the general public would understand from the P versus MP problem and the quest for its proof. This, this is a very good group to ask this question to. Well, I think that uh, probably all of us have given uh, many uh, popular survey talks on the, uh, yeah, basically on the P versus MP problem and, uh, and its importance. But I think that uh, it's a pretty, uh, yeah, I found it easy to describe uh, to popular audiences what the question is about. I mean, Dick uh, explained it, uh, uh, in fact, all three, it's just a question of whether it's harder to prove a theorem than to verify its proof, but uh, this can be taken to any any domain that's uh, comfortable to, to people, whether, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, easier for us to, uh, read the summary of uh, Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie novel where they explain everything, <laughs> or could have we discovered uh, uh, this thing ourselves? Similarly for, uh, you know, um, developing a scientific model given some phenomena, uh, uh, as opposed to just, uh, you know, seeing the model and say, wow, it fits the data. It's, it's, it's probably the right, like Newton's theory or Einstein's theory and so on. So there are many explanations and in, in whatever way you choose of this form to, to present it to audiences, uh, they say, ah, sure, yeah, of course, it's, uh, it's much harder to, um, yeah, it's much harder to solve a problem than to verify its solution. And, uh, you know, they immediately tend to agree that P is different than NP, at least in this uh, uh, high level version. An exhaustive search be always be avoided. Right? This is this this sounds pretty fundamental. This is yeah. Um, one uh, uh, one something something that that Leonid uh, uh, mentioned is the name of Dave Johnson, a uh, uh, great pioneer and colleague that we are missing now. He he, he we lost him uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, uh, and David was, of course, a great expositor of MP completeness, but also uh, he is the founder of, uh, of the branch of, of, of MP completeness theory that has flourished perhaps the most, which is approximability. Uh, you know, he, he taught us that, uh, that there are uh, amazingly important questions in, uh, in uh, uh, the limits to how well we can approximate optimization problems. So, uh, um, it's it's good. It's you know it's 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 very very appropriate that that uh, that uh, Leonid mentioned him, uh, and uh, sort of you know in the subject of other pioneers, uh, uh, the, we now know that uh, that uh, Kurt Gödel, uh, and 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 uh, actually Avi has written a beautiful piece on this, sort of, you know, you know how can, can we in, in, reinterpret uh, Gödel's work and Gödel's last question, so to speak. Uh, I guess uh, he, he, he was, had been around for, he was around for another 15 years, but, uh, but, but, but uh, Gödel's uh, very interesting question to von Neumann, uh, which is essentially uh, tantamount equivalent to people, is people to people. And actually phrased very much like like uh, like uh, uh, Avi uh, understands the question, which is uh, which is uh, 
uh, can uh, finding a proof be as easy as, as uh, verifying it? So we got another, we got a nice question from Yuval Filmis. Um, and Dick, you, you hinted at this sort of question, but uh, Yuval says it explicitly. Would you say that P and NP are good models for tractable and intractable problems, respectively? Uh, on the one hand, subproblems in P are too hard to solve in practice, say if they cannot be solved in near linear time. And on the other hand, some problems in NP are solved in practice all the time. For example, satisfiability and integer programming solvers. Yeah, I think I think that um, NP completeness is an indication that there are limits to what you can do with with a particular problem, but not necessarily a guide to whether you can uh, deal with it uh, well on most instances or get approximate solutions. So. Um, uh, when confronted with a real life problem, uh, one should not let an NP completeness proof deter you from trying to master it in practice. And uh, the phenomenal success of SAT solvers is one, uh, one good uh, indication of what can be done in that direction. There are many mysteries there, but uh, also the uh, development of uh, the theory of the approximate solution of satisfied both uh, NP complete problems and the wonderful results of on hardness of approximation uh, are very significant and very, very relevant. So, um, yeah, you, 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 we, we have tools. Dan Gusfield says try integer programming, it may work. Uh, empirically, things can work out very well, even if the results about worst case complexity uh, limited. I think the, the answer to uh, Yuval's question is uh, the 50 years that followed uh, these discoveries from the 70s. I mean, that's, uh, you know, we are grappling with these questions uh, all the time with, uh, like Dick said, with the approximate uh, algorithms with the uh, uh, publicistic ones, with the uh, instance optimal uh, models, with the uh, uh, yeah, numerous, uh, much more refined complexity classes that study um, the structure like fine grained complexity classes within, uh, uh, um, you know, within P with uh, much stronger hardness assumptions like ETH, exponential time hypothesis. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, they don't <laughs> solve everything, but their understanding of, uh, you know, taught us a lot. And the PCP theorem and other things that were mentioned. I think that uh, we still lack, maybe we'll always lack, uh, a good understanding of what are practical, you know, practically arising uh, instances. This is, uh, you know, a huge question. This is what. You know, I think people are grappling now with the power of uh, strong heuristics like deep learning. Uh, what are the things that they can solve efficiently and what, what not? It also, you know, combines to uh, what uh, Leonid said in his lecture about uh, the fact that we are, we seem to solve problems uh, because we seem to solve, uh, to prove theorems we are interested in, like Fermat and so on. Uh, why, why can we solve these and uh, maybe not others? Are we good at solving problems that we create and only this or, yeah. Yes, I mean, we, that I was, yeah. please, after you. The, one, one, one thing that I'd like to uh, point out is that if we look at some of the most uh, spectacular algorith algorithmic developments of the last few years, yeah, largely in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, we find that these are not well. These are not defined problems in the sense of complexity theory. The premise of complexity theory is that, what, that you're given some specification of the function that you want to compute. Uh, no such specifications are available for many of the AI problems uh, that have been have been solved. Uh, they depend on uh, dealing with uh, extracting information from large databases. And the validation of them is that they give interesting solutions 
uh, consistent with what the databases tell them, but there's no formal definition of what the task is. Just, you know, do a good job on analyzing images or playing chess, but uh, these are not problems in the formal sense that we uh, theorists uh, like to deal with. So there's a whole other set of considerations out there that uh, need to be developed. Very true, and 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 Leonid uh, also mentioned uh, started by uh, referring to uh, the amazing cognitive abilities of human of, of, of human intelligence, especially. You know, he also mentioned these insects, but but uh, but uh, uh, that uh, that uh, uh, goes far beyond where uh, these uh, these. Uh, 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 great successes in uh, uh, in artificial neural networks can go, in the sense that, uh, as as Leonin pointed out, uh, you we endlessly create our brain is capable of endlessly creating um, new frameworks for looking at at uh, at uh, the world and and and, and uh, creating problems and solutions. So um, uh, something that something that uh, most of the with a, with a possible exception of, of, of uh, 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 pre-trained uh, uh, systems in, in NLP, uh, but most of the existing successes of deep learning uh, do not come close to have the same gen generality and versatility as, uh, as the animal and human brain. All right, so we should wrap up by five up or so. So for those in the audience, you know, we can probably sneak in, you know, a couple more questions. Uh, so if you have something you'd like to ask, this is the this is the last chance to, to enter it. Um, let me pass on one uh, kind of uh, open-ended question, which I, I imagine is for the whole group. Uh, how would you envision the debate? Basically, you know, if somebody proves p not equal to np, what happens to complexity theory? So. So how do you envision the development of the science of complexity theory post a proof, if we ever see one, of P not equal to NP? Uh, probably it will depend on the proof and will depend on the exponent. <laughs> I think that uh, you know, if a proof like this is ever found, we will learn so much. Uh, yeah, it, it will be a revolution yeah. of the... the the nature of the greatest revolution in science is such a process. And we will be reading the papers for the case. It will open, it will open completely new, new avenues to our thinking. Leonid? What do you think? What do you think? Uh, uh, what, do we, uh, what do we think will be the aftermath of the P, P is not equal to NP? Uh, I, I, I'm not, uh, could you say loudly? Uh, uh, what do you think would be the aftermath of a P is not equal to NP proof? What will happen after what that? What do you think will be the answer? The, no, no, but what will, be, what will happen after we have the answer that P is not equal to NP? Or that P equals to NP. Uh, I have very bad audio here, so um, you're asking what do you think will be the answer to P equal in P or, or what was the question? Can you try? Uh, once we have a proof that P is not equal to MP, if we ever see one, what will happen after that? What would happen if we see whether I think humanity doesn't have much time to live anyway, because we have, we are so creative in uh, creating suicide tools for ourselves. So I, uh, it may be that we will never know the answer. <laughs> I, um, Let's not finish uh, So there are, there are two different uh, uh, things. One, pe some people say that the problem is not so difficult, but just very intimidating. So nobody can afford to think about it because you have to write three papers per year 
uh, with uh, various junk to get funding. Uh, so nobody can invest 20 years into some difficult problem. On the other hand, some people uh, think that the answer would be completely surprising, neither uh, of any of the two which we expect. Mm. Um, and uh, somehow I don't uh, think that the evidence is that NP is exponential. I think the evidence is the opposite. Uh, I once uh, had an argument, I think, with Mumford. He uh, asked uh, how come people can doubt that NP is exponential because every mathematician knows that finding uh, a proof is exponentially harder than checking the proofs. And I say that Okay, let's see, the mathematicians have no idea what exponent is. So I suppose checking a proof uh, is comparable to work to the number of bits in typical paper. And suppose finding a proof is a typical uh, word in number of bits in all papers ever written in mathematics because nobody probably spent more time on that. And one is just a cube of another, not an exponent. Um, exponent of one line of text is bigger than the universe. And nevertheless, we have only very, very few examples of problems which survived several centuries of being famous. So the evidence is not uh, that NP is exponential, but who knows? Anyway, I am much more interested in finding the way how we do solve these problems. And we do seem to have some very good mechanisms in our brains. So we should try to figure this out. I think that's a very important question. And I also wonder uh, whether the transcript of the talks will be uh, posted because sometimes some details is easier to see from transcripts than from talk, especially uh, Dick mentioned many very interesting details and I did not pick up all of them. It's just, so the, the session is being recorded and archived for posterity. Um, and uh, you know, Leona, you gave us a, a written transcript also of your talk so that will be posted alongside the video uh, with some other material as well. So definitely, this is not just a purely ephemeral event. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be available uh, in the future. I, I read uh, Leonid's uh, last message as a call to this community, to everybody listening, to go work on proving lower bounds. I'm completely with it. All right, so we're, we're pretty much out of time. Any, anyone want to add a closing comment or should we wrap up? Tim, would you uh, like to comment on on the uh, approach that you've taken in the book that you're bringing out uh, about dealing with special cases, et cetera? Dick, it's very kind of you to set me up. Um, I, uh, I'll just, I'll, the one sentence I'll say is that there's a, a new book out called Beyond the Worst Case Analysis of Algorithms. Um, and it's very much trying to tackle head on, for example, the question you've all um, raised and, and you know and really it's you know I really view it as um, you know many of frankly many of the the trees growing and the research described in that book come from seeds um, you know planted by people on this call 50 years ago um, so definitely you know I think the high level takeaway is just the theory community you know responds to challenges right so you know we develop our theories and if we see it, we, if we see they're not refined enough to um, you know, help us understand real world computation, we come back and we refine it some more. And I thought fine grade complexity, which Avi brought up, I think that's been an amazing development, for example, um, in 21st century uh, theoretical computer science with lots of important um, practical ramifications. Um, so, so there is a book, but I think the high level takeaway is just these are all, you know, as others have mentioned, these are all problems that I think our community should feel proud that, you know, they're hard problems, but, you know, we really, I think, tackle most of them uh, head on, and I think we're continuing to do that. Okay, well, let's end the session. Uh, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, you know, I think this was really a, a historic event. Uh, so, Professor Cook, Professor Levin, uh, Professor Karp, um, you know, Christos and Avi, uh, 
thanks all of you for 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 making this uh, so much fun. Okay, so thank you. We'll end it there. Yeah. Thank you.